G'day folks, and welcome to a check on chain update for the 14th of May. Well, Bitcoin has gone a little bit to sleep. And generally speaking, and in my experience, when Bitcoin goes to sleep and volatility starts to compress, it's usually a sign that there is a period of heightened volatility on the road ahead. So what I want to do today is a couple of things. We're going to explore some of the frameworks that I use when I think about Bitcoin's volatility, some of the different metrics and tools I use to actually measure it. And really why we're doing that is to contextualize and to try and understand where Bitcoin really is during its market cycle. And volatility tends to evolve alongside the Bitcoin market cycle. So we can actually start to use it to delineate euphoric bulls from enthusiastic bulls, from bear markets, from capitulation events. So we can actually use volatility to try and understand more about where we are in the current cycle. So Bitcoin's volatility is obviously quite infamous, right? It's known for this. Critics love to point at it and say, hey, it can't be a currency, it can't be a store of value because it's too volatile. What they tend to leave out is two important facts. The first one is that volatility is actually the highest during a bull market. So it's volatile to the upside, which is actually a good thing. If you actually compare Bitcoin's volatility to the rest of the world as it stands, it's very similar to some of the highest performing stocks in the US. And that's because they are trending higher. And actually many of the, you know, the S&P index Really, it's the Magnificent 7 and the not-so-magnificent 493. And the reason the volatility of the index isn't very good is because there's 493 stocks that also aren't performing very good, and that number is increasing by the day. So what we're really seeing is that Bitcoin's volatility profile is becoming less and less of a point that people can argue against because that volatility is to the upside. It's increasingly comparable to other assets. And really, it tells us a lot about the current market structure, which is going to be the purpose of this video. So for part one of this session, what we're going to do is study Bitcoin's volatility profile, understand how it moves, how we can use it to define different market cycles. And I'll introduce a really important framework that I use to really understand which of the four quadrants Bitcoin is really trading within. We're going to look at the typical market regimes and really use that framework and apply it to the last nine years, but then also um, since 2022 bears, so a bit more of a macro versus a micro structure. And then in part two of the video, which will be available for our paid Substack subscribers over at checkonchain.com, we'll go through a bit more of a deep dive of where I see us in our current market cycle, having set the scene and looked at all the volatility profiles and established what it looks like to be in these different quadrants of the market. How does it currently look? Are there any signs pointing to weakness? Are there signs pointing to strength? What is my general outlook and assessment from there on? So for everyone who's viewing this on YouTube, please do give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the section below. Uh, we do love getting those comments because it helps us iterate and find the different topics and pieces of feedback that you guys are looking for. Uh, but without further ado, let's get stuck right into the analysis. Okay, so for this session, we're actually going to be using some of the marked up charts from our Substack report. And the reason being, there's obviously a lot of markups on there. And I think this will be a better way of actually going through and telling the story rather than trying to do this in a live fire exercise. Uh, I've essentially put a lot of the thought into building up these charts. So we'll just stick with these rather than the live format for now. Now, what I want to highlight, I mentioned before that Bitcoin's volatility actually tends to increase during bull markets. Now, by the way, this is quite commodity-like. Most equities don't trade like this. If you're looking at the equities, the VIX will normally spike during sell-offs and it will then compress and volatility will go down as the market reverts back to the upside. Well, if we look at Bitcoin, the 2016-17 bull, the 2019 uptrend, the 2021 bull, and then off the bottom, our 2023 market and 24 market, we can actually see that volatility trends higher. And now these are longer term volatility metrics from three months over to one year in terms of the rolling window, but Bitcoin's volatility actually tends to increase during bull markets. So this is what I mean when I say volatility is actually primarily to the upside. During more bearish trends, we actually see volatility decrease. Now this is a function of a lot of the luster of the moon math and everything wearing off and you know, people come back down to a sense of gravity and they realize, oh man, maybe it wasn't really as, a, as rip roaring as I thought it was and speculation dies down. So yes, Bear markets can still be volatile, particularly around capitulation style events. We'll still get these large peaks and you know events that are more volatile. But generally speaking, we actually see the market compress and almost get lulled to sleep. And generally that lulling to sleep results in a final capitulation leg until that floor gets put in. But just noting the trend, we typically get more volatile during bull markets. 
Now, what you also may have noticed is that our current market cycle, now granted, is not a perfect apple to apple comparison, unless you believe that the top is in, because in that case, it is apples to apples. But when we look at the end of a bull phase, right, 2016, 17, when we look at 2021, our volatility generally reaches a crescendo, right? March 2020 is one of these weird events where it kind of blew everything out because it was just such a big event. And again, models are not supposed to catch absolutely everything. They need to be flexible. And we, you know, we're looking at things in a general sense here. But if we look at the volatility back here in 2017 at the peak, 120 to 150% on these longer term timeframes. In 2021, that had actually reduced to 80 to 100%. And then where we are at the moment, and granted, if we think that the market has further to go, which I fall into that camp, then we're at 40 to 60%. This can potentially continue to drift higher. But as it stands today, we're something like 30% to 50% of where we've been in previous cycles. So that's kind of the ballpark. So we are actually seeing that as Bitcoin grows, as it matures as an asset, as it gets larger, as more institutional capital starts to float in, we are seeing more and more of the asset with less volatility. Right? We're seeing the market trade in a way that doesn't have the same volatility that it has in previous cycles. So it's giving us a bit of a context switch that, you know, whilst Bitcoin is volatile, it's volatile to the upside, but that volatility, which can be a hurdle, particularly for more institutional type investors, is actually compressing over time. And in many ways, this kind of volatility profiles in line with some of the best performing stocks in the US, right? Not so much with the, the, uh, the S&P 500, because you've got 493 stocks that aren't doing so great. But in terms of those top performing stocks, they're actually in a very similar volatility regime. So a, a very interesting dynamic there and uh, really putting some of that FUD to bed. Now, if we look at it from another perspective, if we, uh, the purple line that we have here is our one year rolling volatility. So think about like the long term baseline. Now, this is where I want to start breaking things down into a bit of market structure. In the yellow, we've got our one week, so much shorter term volatility. Now, you'll often see me look at things when I talk about like momentum, particularly with on-chain activity metrics, I'll look at a long-term baseline and a faster one. But what we're looking at here is faster, shorter-term volatility, what's happening over the last week relative to that longer-term trend baseline. Now, notice that there's generally a phase. I call this the enthusiastic bull in the phase between the cycle low and when we start getting up towards all-time high. That enthusiastic bull transitions into the euphoric bull as we break up to a new all-time high. Now, notice that is also very typically the regime when one-week volatility starts performing and trading a lot higher than our long-term. So we can actually see this in many metrics, whether it's the Mayer multiple, whether it's the MVRV, it's kind of this new resonant frequency. Once we break above the all-time high, Bitcoin gets much more volatile and notably so. And we're actually just seeing this from one particular perspective here, right? Volatility and market cycles, they have a bit of a relationship and a bit of a characteristic. And typically speaking, that break to a new all-time high tends to be that point in the sand where things really start to shift. In many ways, 2019 was an attempt. 2019 really did try to get up to that next elevation, but the market just wasn't ready yet. Didn't have enough juice, didn't quite get above that 14K up to the 20 level. So in many instances, 2019 was an attempt, but it never quite got there in the end. So this is where I want to introduce a framework. And this is a framework that I've been using to think about Bitcoin's volatility and just general market structure for several years now. Now, full credit actually goes to Doc Severson, who is actually, I would consider my, my market mentor, someone who taught me a huge deal about what I know about markets and just how they trade, how they move, particularly in the world of market psychology. So a huge amount of credit over there to Doc. But really, this, this framework breaks it down into four different quadrants. And it's based on two different categories. The direction of the market. Are we trading sideways or are we trending in some direction? And the volatility regime, are we in a volatile period or is it relatively quiet? Now, generally speaking, when we're talking about volatile and sideways, now this can be applied to macro and micro, so multi-month timeframes, but also in terms of micro timeframes. So we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. But volatile and sideways typically talks about consolidations. Now you can see here, I've actually got the top, the 2021 peak, right? Most of 2021. I would consider to be a macro scale, volatile and sideways because it was no doubt volatile, but it more or less went absolutely nowhere, went sideways. Now, quiet and sideways is what I would consider to be exhaustion periods. These don't happen very frequently, but quiet and sideways typically explains the very, very bottom of bear markets. 
complete and total apathy, months to years of going absolutely nowhere. So back in November, December 2018, when FTX blew up, all of these really described a period of exhaustion and volatility at those points in time were actually some of the lowest we've ever seen in Bitcoin's history. So very uncommon, but they do happen typically in late stage bears. Now, the market that we're really going to talk about today is quiet and trending. And this is very much categorizing stable, robust, and resilient bull markets. We rally, we go into a period of consolidation. We rally, we go into a period of consolidation. We're stair-stepping. We're starting to move higher in these kind of slow and steady maneuvers. And we'll talk about the micro structure and the macro structure of this shortly. But what typically happens when we break to a new all-time high is we move towards a volatile and trending market. And Bitcoin, as I mentioned before, is a bit commodity-like in the way it trades. And actually, unstable bear markets, as well as euphoric bull markets, where obviously the bull leads into the bear, this both, in my opinion, tend to trade in a volatile and trending behavior pattern. Once we break above the all-time high, historically speaking at least, we've moved out of a quiet and trending market and into a volatile and trending market, but we actually maintain that volatility through the first leg of the bear, which also makes it quite important to try and identify that distinction when we switch over. So anyway, let's jump back into the charts and we'll explore this framework and how it actually plays out over time. Okay, so here we are looking at the chart and, and I've actually color coded each one of these zones, these boxes based on that previous framework. And we've got our little tags here to tell us which ones they are. So let's start with the least common ones, quiet and sideways. These blue zones down the bottom here, we're really looking at very, very quiet periods. The market goes you know, almost nowhere for a long period of time, for a period of months. Everyone usually thinks the Bitcoin market is dead. The narrative is that it's dead and that it's all over. But historically speaking, it's usually when the hodlers are there building the floor. Now, it does typically happen during late stage bears, which hopefully we shouldn't be worrying about anytime soon. But nevertheless, just one for the tool belt to remember that quiet and sideways is really where we're going to start this whole process. Now, quiet and trending you've got here in these green boxes, and we will explore this right-hand side of the chart in more detail on the next slide. We're very much looking at it on a macro scale here, and the, the, the idea of a framework is not to be perfectly pre to precise. It, the idea is to make it quite bite-sized, but also flexible, right? We want to simplify the world. We want to be able to understand what's going on, but we also don't want it to be you know, full of edge cases, so it needs to be flexible enough to move. So what we're looking at is during these quiet and trending, we typically just rally, consolidate, rally, consolidate. And consolidations, by the way, they don't have to trade sideways. They can be pullbacks because pullbacks resets the expectations of the bulls. It gives the bears a little bit of firepower. But ultimately, if the market wants to head higher, those bears are going to have to cover at some point in time. So these quiet and trending markets really are a rally, a period of consolidation, a rally, a period of consolidation. And generally speaking, the longer the consolidation or the deeper the pullback, the healthier that is. It kind of resets everybody's expectations. But we can see that as, and we actually got our realized volatility profile down the bottom in yellow, notice that when we break up above the previous all-time high, things can really, the volatility starts to pick up, right? Now, whether this is a quiet and trending or a mix between volatile and trending and quiet, again, trying to keep things relatively flexible here, but you can see 2017 is a great example. We had a volatile uptrend, which then turned into a volatile downtrend. Um, also, somewhere between a volatile and trending market and a volatile and sideways market. But really, volatility remains relatively high, but decays as the bear market kicks in. 2021, we can really see this chunk here was a volatile and sideways market. We, if you closed your eyes for 12 months, you're at the exact same price, but everyone's been liquidated left, right, and center. But that usually leads, this is a period of instability. And then we move into a volatile and trending downtrend. So that's kind of the general structure at a macro scale, but well, we can actually apply this framework on a much smaller time frame and actually break it down smaller and smaller. So where we talk about a quiet and trending market, it's actually made up of many quiet and trending uptrends and then volatile and sideways consolidations. Quiet and trending uptrend, volatile and sideways consolidations. 
I would argue that this August period back here was a little bit more like a quiet sideways, a bit more of an exhausted pattern. This could have actually transitioned into a deeper bear, but it just went to absolute sleep. We went nowhere for weeks and months at a time, very much like a period of exhaustion, like a micro capitulation back here. It was quite an interesting period. But as we see in our current market structure, we're going through a stair-stepping bull. We trade higher and then we just consolidate. We trade higher and then we just consolidate. So in many ways, the quiet and trending macro trend is actually made up of smaller, quiet and trending, volatile and sideways, quiet and trending, volatile and sideways. Now the challenge, as always, right? It's very easy to draw, draw green and yellow boxes and say, oh, this is the shape, this is the structure. That's all you know, relatively easy. The hard part is actually looking for that transition into a period of instability. Right, which can then create the bear market. Now, we, of course, everything will start with a, you know, people will look at it, oh, it's a Wyckoff distribution or it's some other kind of distribution pattern. All of these things can and will happen. But the question we need to really answer is, are we starting to see instability, which could potentially lead us from a sideways and volatile market into a volatile trending market, but in the wrong direction? Right, starting to look for when things start to really turn the tides and move into another regime. So with that said, that's going to be the end of part one. What I'm now going to do is move to part two and explore a lot more about the actual structure within this right-hand side of the chart and understand what instability actually looks like, what my general read is in terms of how robust this uptrend actually is, and whether there's any indicators telling us that the momentum is starting to shift in the wrong direction. So let's get started. So thanks folks for tuning in for part one of our weekly analysis. If you enjoyed the video and you want access to the full video and the rest of our analysis, do head over to our Substack and hit subscribe. As a paying member, you'll actually get access to a second piece of analysis each week, as well as the comment section where you can ask me questions and we'll answer them in a Q&A on a regular basis. So thank you so much for all of your support. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.